Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am flying solo tonight. Don't worry, the visibility is good. I have no idea what that meant. Um, oh, well, moving on. Uh, I, I apologize. This is, I mean, I know we prepared everybody that we may have a podcast a little late or what have you. Um, I guess I do have a co-host as one of my cats that doesn't think that I'm allowed to talk to anyone else. Um, and you'll probably hear her from time to time. I'm trying to get her to just sit somewhere else and be quiet, but I don't think that's likely. So we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, I, I did mean to get this out earlier, but those of you who know me know that I am a terminal procrastinator, so um, here we are. But better late than never, and uh, I hope. Anyway, um, I got some interesting, well, I hope, um, some interesting history to talk about tonight. Uh, I think that this is um, a, a, maybe a fading memory in American history, Um but I think it's relevant, and uh, as as all this stuff is, um, just as an illustration of how the the media and the government will lie to you over and over and over again, even after the information, the the facts have been um, uh, given to the public, and you know that they're lying, they'll continue to lie. It's kind of impressive in a way, just the just the the sheer obstinacy of it, but. Um, before I get to that, I did want to address um, the um, the news of Putin, or I guess of Russia, um, pulling out of the New START Treaty, which is a, an exaggeration of what happened. Um, first, he suspended cooperation, uh, Vladimir Putin suspended cooperation um, with the U.S. in the New START Treaty. Truth is, it doesn't really change much right now. Um, the part that he's suspended is the um, is the inspections, like allowing inspections. Um, but the truth is that they haven't really been doing inspections since COVID began. And I guess after the Ukraine war started, my understanding is that the U.S. wouldn't allow any Russians in to do any inspections, but the U.S. was asking to go inspect the Russian sites or um, program. And the Russians finally said, look, you know, you're not letting, you're not holding up your end. We're not going to hold up our end either. Um, so he said that he, he planned to stay within the, um, the limitations set in the new start treaty. The new start treaty limits the total number of, uh, I, I think it's deployed nuclear weapons, but it may be total nuclear weapons that each country can have. Um, and Putin said he didn't plan to start building more weapons or, you know, he was still going to abide by the, the, um, limitations in the treaty. He just wasn't going to permit inspections anymore. But the other part of it is that the, the U S media is making this huge deal out of a, that Putin pulled out of the very last nuclear treaty, um, between the two countries and he's, uh, destroyed all this work that was put in decades ago to make the world safer and so on. And there's truth in that certainly, but the part that they keep leaving out is that there were, um, really four major nuclear treaties and that this is the last of them because the U S pulled out of the first three. And it started with W. Bush um, leaving the uh, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 2002, and then promptly the U.S. placed uh, HS Mark 41 um, missile launchers in Romania and Poland right there on the Russian frontier, essentially. And the Mark 41, the Aegis missiles are, uh, you know, the, these Aegis launchers, they're supposed to be, equipped with defensive missiles, anti, um, anti-ballistic missiles, but they can also be essentially overnight refitted to launch, uh, nuclear tipped, um, cruise missiles. So 
there's good reason for the Russians to be upset about that. Then um, the rest happened under Trump, where Trump withdrew from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty in 2019, and then he later withdrew from the Open Skies Treaty in 2020. The Open Skies Treaty was the one that allowed overflights, uh, surveillance overflights, um, so that each country could assure itself that the other country wasn't, you know, for example, um, switching over the uh, the missiles on the uh, on the Aegis um, to uh, offensive missiles instead of defensive missiles, etc. And of course, Trump was was ready to let the New Start Treaty um, expire as well, but uh, Biden saved it when he came into office and extended it for another five years. So that's like about the best thing that Biden's done while in office, although it doesn't matter much now. Um, so we may talk about this more in the future, but I did want everybody to know the history there that um, certainly Russia is at fault from for suspending this last one, but the truth is that the it wouldn't have been such a big deal if the U.S. hadn't already... Um, <laughs> abrogated the first three treaties. And I'm not really paying attention to my volumes here, so I hope this is coming through all right. Too much to do when I'm the only person here. All right. So um, now I wanted to get into what I really had planned for the evening. Uh, I think that that a lot of our, um, a lot of our audience is younger. Uh, you know, um, Gen X, millennial, and below. I know that we have some boomers out there, and maybe this will be more familiar or more um, fresher, I guess, in your memory. Actually, none of the rest of us would be in our memory at all because we weren't alive at the time. Freya, stay in your own chair. I promise I will play with you when the podcast is over. All right. I have her diverted for a moment anyway. So... Um, I just wanted to talk about some of the major points where uh, the U.S. government um, and the mainstream media, which is really all there was then, um, just outright lied to the American public about what was going on. And it started with the very beginning of this, because this, this, uh, the Vietnam conflict um, went on for decades, um, starting, I mean, U.S. involvement really starting right after World War II. Um, but for the most part, it was a, uh, a French colonial issue um, up until the, the late 50s, n- mid to late 50s. And um, the way it worked is that the, the French had a colony, uh, had Vietnam as a colony. They weren't willing to give it up. The Vietnamese had been trying to fight off the French for a long time. In fact, uh, Ho Chi Minh, um, who was the... Uh, revolutionary or rebel leader uh, had asked um, had asked Woodrow Wilson for support uh, against the French colonial um, empire back in the teens, and uh, he was ignored then. But then we supported Ho Chi Minh during World War II when he was fighting the the Japanese occupation, and then after World War II, he said, "Hey, you know." Um, after all the, the help that, uh, that we gave you fighting the Japanese here, uh, we'd really appreciate it if you would help us, um, throw off the, the French government and, um, Truman ignored him again, like, thanks for your help. Good luck now, (laughs) I guess. And, uh, so then in 1954, when the French had more or less given up, finally, um, they signed the uh, Geneva Accords, and it was presented... Now, at this point, Eisenhower is the president in the U.S. Um, his, uh, he's got the Dulles brothers running his foreign policy. This is uh, uh, John Foster Dulles, who was his secretary of state, and Alan Dulles was the director of the CIA at the time. And both of the Dulles brothers were rabidly anti-communist. I mean, to the point where... Foster, he, he went by Foster, not John, um, where Foster actually supported, and in fact, uh, before he was brought in as Secretary of State, he kind of had to throw in this, um, you know, make some amends for 
uh, bad image when he was supporting um, Hitler and the Nazis as a, as a bulwark against Bolshevism um, in Russia. So he, he actually sided with the Nazis right up until we went to war with the Nazis, which uh, he wasn't in public office at the time. But anyway, it, it left a bad image. Um, but he still got to be uh, Secretary of State. But th- this is just to illustrate how much he detested communism, um, saw it as a, a real threat to the world. And uh, Allen wasn't far off. Um, at any rate, it, the Geneva Accords in 1954 were presented by the U.S. and government and media to the people um, as creating a communist North Vietnam and an independent sovereign South Vietnam divided at the 17th latitude. But that's not at all what it was. Um, It actually explicitly created a a provisional military demarcation line between the French uh, colonial forces and the Viet Minh forces, which were the Ho Chi Minh's um, army, uh, essentially the Vietnamese National Army. And, uh, And that line was just to, to, it was essentially a ceasefire line um, until they could have national elections and the uh, agreement was that they would that they would in two years in 1956 have national elections to elect a uh, a single government for the entire entirety of Vietnam, and um, it actually stated explicitly in the final declaration of the accord that uh, the demarcation line quote should not in any way be interpreted as constituting a political or territorial boundary end quote. But it was presented by the U.S. as as explicitly creating two separate nations. Um, And then uh, that was later used as an excuse to get involved as much as anything, that the North Vietnamese um, were moving into South Vietnam and uh, we needed to keep South Vietnam independent. But South Vietnam was never meant to be independent. It It wasn't a country. Nonetheless, uh, the U.S. supported... um, I'm not sure how to pronounce some of these Vietnamese names, so I'm doing the best I can. Um, I'm going to guess uh, Wo Dinh Diem um, took over as president of South Vietnam uh, with U.S. support. And in um, 1956, he was encouraged uh, to, um, to stall, to avoid, to uh, ignore... Um, essentially not to hold the, the national elections that were supposed to be held to uh, as part of the um, Geneva Accords. And he didn't. Um, but because there was some concern at the State Department that the uh, American citizens might not get behind um, a leader who had just uh, refused to hold elections, because democracy is, is such an important issue to us, that... <clears throat> they um, instead had him hold a referendum um, between himself and uh, the previous ruler of South Vietnam, quote unquote, who had been the uh, the French uh, the French's puppet government. Um, now this guy, whose name I forget, King something or other, um, he was actually in France at the time. He wasn't even in Vietnam in 1956, and uh, they. Uh, prohibited anybody campaigning on his behalf. And um, so they essentially did one of these things that the U.S. likes to still support, which is a, uh, a democratic election with essentially one person on the ballot. Um, and then holding that up as the, as the pinnacle of democracy, which they did. And uh, even a- after the elections were held, the, the farce elections were held, um, he was told that he should present by the Americans, that he should present that he got 60 to 70 percent of the vote. But instead, he went out there and said he got 98.2 percent of the vote, which is probably closer to the truth. And uh, and then the <laughs> the New York Times actually held it up as a as, you know, the height of democracy, how wonderful a democracy this was that this guy got elected um, in a farce election that wasn't part of the national elections that were supposed to be held, uh, et cetera. So that's step one of the the government and the media lying to you. And like I said, you know, the the media was just always taking the government line. So in the case of the wording of the um, of the accords, 
in terms of it separating or creating a separate South Vietnam. That's what the government was saying, and the media duty, dutifully reported it. But it was right there in the text of the accord. Um, all they had to do is read, and I suspect that they did. And they knew that it didn't say that there was a new country that had been created, but they didn't report it. And then um, later, when the U.S. was getting more involved, now, as far as I can tell, like um, the U.S. had uh, advisors, um, you know, as early as 1954, and then they actually had pilots that were dropping bombs in North Vietnam as early as, uh, I heard, I mean, I read as early as 1959. It seems more likely that it was more like 1961. Um, so the, there was a war being waged in Vietnam without, with American troops, without the American people being aware really. And then, um, it really, I guess, hit the fan in, uh, 1964 with the Gulf of Tonkin incident. So here's our next big event where everybody's lying to you. The, um, the Gulf of Tonkin incidents occurred on August 2nd and August 4th of, of 1964. Uh, in the first, on the first date, the USS Maddox, um, it was reported that the USS Maddox, which is a destroyer, uh, underwent an unprovoked attack by North Vietnamese torpedo boats. And then... On the second date, um, it was essentially the same story that the Maddox and now the USS Turner Joy also, which is another destroyer, um, were attacked. And that this led directly to the uh, Gulf of Tonkin resolution that, um, that LBJ asked Congress to pass, which they did, and it allowed him to take any actions. They essentially gave him a, a blank slate to do whatever he he wanted in Vietnam. It gave him a blank slate to, um, do whatever actions he felt were necessary to protect American, um, assets. Now here's what actually happened. <laughs> um, on, uh, August the 2nd, the South Vietnamese were, uh, performing CIA directed raids on the North Vietnamese coast. And part of the objective was to trigger the North Vietnamese radar um, so that the U.S. destroyers could pinpoint them, the locations, um, for them to be attacked. Uh, so the, the U.S. was actually involved in this raid, and this, the USS Maddox specifically was involved in the raid. And even in the aftermath, the, the USS Maddox sunk a couple of uh, boats that attacked them, and the report was, I believe, that they were hit by a single bullet. Now, on August 4th, neither the Maddox nor the Turner Joy could even find the targets. They were claimed that they were under constant um, uh, torpedo threat, that there were, you know, lots and lots of torpedoes being um, launched at them by North Vietnamese. But they couldn't find any targets that were launching the torpedoes and uh, with their fire control radar. All they could find was each other, and to the point where the Maddox almost fired on the Turner Joy, um, but managed to not. And then uh, it seemed to be, in their review of the action, um, they had like a rookie um, sonar uh, sonar tech who was on the Maddox, who was listening to his own propeller, like the Maddox's own propeller, and that's what he was picking up as uh, torpedoes. And then they got, you know, another guy to come in and listen. He was like, nope, everything's fine. We're all, we're all good. So there doesn't seem to have been any attack at all. Nothing fired at them from anywhere. No enemies, nothing targeting them. And it was reported as such to, um, when it went up the chain of command, that it was a, essentially a false alarm. But it didn't stop LG, LBJ from presenting the Gulf of Tonkin resolution to Congress. Now, the other interesting part of this is that the Gulf of Tonkin resolution had been written months before. They just needed to fill in the blanks with, uh, with dates and um, descriptions. They were just waiting for any event that they could use to justify um, moving into Vietnam militarily. And the reason that they were doing that is because back in 1956, when they, um, when they kept the uh, national elections that were supposed to happen from happening... Um, even Eisenhower at the time said that if they'd held the elections, the Ho Chi Minh probably would have gotten 80% of the vote. 
So the U.S. had lost the political, but the political battle for Vietnam, um, and so they were trying to move into a battle they felt they could win. And uh, and this is how they did it. And of course, it cost the lives of sixty thousand um, U.S. soldiers, roughly. And well, I mean that was just dead there. Not to mention all the problems when they came for those that came home. And then um, the estimates are that between three and five million um, citizens, residents, Vietnamese, Laotians, and Cambodians died um, in the course of the war in Indochina. And it's likely that something like three million Vietnamese were killed and uh, between one and two million um, Laotians and Cambodians. Also, as another side note, the the bombing in Cambodia um, probably directly led to the rise of the Khmer Rouge. And so you could potentially blame all the deaths that, of the Khmer Rouge as a direct result of U.S. intervention in Vietnam. <clears throat> but, you know, we're, we don't really need to play the blame game. I think the next most important bit to, that I wanted to go over here <clears throat> Sorry, I also put things off because I had some dental work last week and my mouth still hurt. It's not so bad now, but I'm starting to feel it. So I'm going to try and wrap this up a little quicker than I'd planned because I got so much information. Um, but I, I, there's a real simple point to be made here. Um, and that's uh, that through the course of the war, um, the Americans were being told that we were there to, um, to rescue the South Vietnamese from the dangerous communists coming down from the North. Um, a lot of this was, um, informed by the idea that Russia was directing, um, the communists in the North. Doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, it seems like a real nationalist movement. There was actually quite a bit of this going on around the world. Uh, it was really the World War II marked the beginning of the real end of, um, of the colonial empires. And so there were a lot of former colonies that were rebelling against their quote-unquote masters. And, um, and there were a lot of strong nationalist movements going on. And many of them fell into communism, and it didn't have anything to do with the Russians. It was just that they were, um, they were acting against the existing order that, they had been, uh, that they'd been suffering under sometimes for centuries certainly decades. But the idea that we were actually fighting to save the South Vietnamese is also just, uh, it's inane, because those are the people we were actually fighting. Um, because Ho Chi Minh would have gotten 80% of the national vote, you can guess that a majority of the people in the South actually supported him as well. Uh, and they certainly didn't support the the government that the U.S. had put in power there. Um, and they, but more than anything, and this is kind of what you see all over the place, when you have foreign intervention in a, a local political system, then the locals tend to rebel um, in, in pretty strong ways. I mean, we've been seeing it for decades again with the terror war in uh, in Afghanistan, in Somalia, in uh, Yemen, in Iraq, all over the place, Syria, everywhere that we're involved, um, there's a real strong local movement against whoever the Americans have put in power. People don't like to be ruled by um, by foreigners. I, that's, I guess, what it comes down to as much as anything. Um, I also uh, came across some uh, some statistics just just recently that suggest that you know, we tend to associate, um, <clears throat> excuse me, tend to associate suicide bombing with, uh, with Islam. But there was obviously plenty of suicide bombing in Vietnam as well. And the statistics I, I came across, um, strongly suggest that, uh, suicide bombing is actually related to, um, an invasion by a foreign power. That's where suicide bombings occur, is where uh, the people have been invaded by a foreign power. 
doesn't seem to have anything to do with religion or ethnicity or any kind of background, cultural background, but there is a strong association with invasion by a foreign power. Just something to remember, I suppose. So, uh, like I said, we were actually waging the war against the South Vietnamese, against the people um, of South Vietnam. There was a bunch of uh, uh, relocations, taking people, destroying their villages, moving them into essentially concentration camps by the U.S. military. Um, the U.S. military was destroying villages all over the place. Um, anywhere where there was enemy activity, which was pretty much everywhere, um, they have these huge uh, kill count uh, things, and actually it was used as a measure of how well we were doing. So um, I, we talked about it before that they started saying anywhere where there was enemy activity, anybody that was killed there was assumed to be an enemy soldier. Um, men, women, and children didn't really matter. If they were killed in that area, they must have been a bad guy. And this is how they um, pushed the kill counts up uh, to show how well they were doing. And they pushed the kill counts up right up to about 3 million people. Um, and, the, you know, there was obviously also all the deforestation and burning that went on. Um, that they were, uh, you know, the problem was that the enemy was everywhere. And it's not really that the enemy was everywhere. It's that the U.S. created enemies everywhere. That they were fighting against the popular movement in the entire country. Um, that the uh, Viet Cong don't seem to have been really directed by um, Ho Chi Minh. There was the North Vietnamese Army in the north, and then there were the local militias, essentially, in the south that were fighting against the American occupation. And the idea that we were trying to protect these people is really absurd when you look at the damage that we did. Um, we actually uh, talked... Um, a fair bit about um, the Mille massacre, massacre um, on an early episode of this podcast, uh, episode 29, The Brief History of Farce. So go back and check that one out. Mille wasn't the only thing that we talked about, but there's some interesting information in that. And what seems to be more apparent as more information comes out about Vietnam, you have um, like uh, the book by Nick Terse, Kill Everything That Moves, that is based... I mean, I think almost entirely on um, official army investigations, it appears that Mille wasn't, a, wasn't an aberration, that this kind of thing was going on all over South Vietnam all the time, that they were just massacring um, villagers, that they were wiping out villages, that they were just going through burning everything. It was, And these are the people that we were supposedly there to help. But the people that we were there to help didn't agree with us about how their country should be run, so they were all considered enemies. And um, this is more or less the attitude that the U.S. military has had and the U.S. government has had almost everywhere that it's been involved. And the, the lies continue right up until the very end um, with the Paris Accords in 1973, uh, where you essentially you have the same thing. The Paris Accords set out a plan to reunify Vietnam under a single government. It was a step-by-step -step process to reunify Vietnam under a single government um, without any kind of foreign intervention, which is, you know, the Americans were supposed to pull out all of their combat troops within six weeks, I think, um, or 60 days, maybe it was. I think it was 60 days now that I'm thinking about it. Anyway... Uh, the U.S. was supposed to get all their combat troops out there pretty quickly, um, but uh, they again claimed that the um, that the accords uh, separated the two uh, governments um, that uh, and claimed that the North Vietnamese were um, uh, were not abiding by the accords as an excuse to stay involved, uh, and of course the um, the very last Americans finally left. Vietnam in 1975, when uh, I guess the war officially ended. Um, the other thing that the uh, Paris Accords did was that the U.S. was supposed to pay reparations for the damages that they'd done in Indochina. Um, and remember that this was an, an agrarian population; it's an agricultural population. They, you know, they they lived on um, these little community farms, essentially. Um, and uh, the Americans had destroyed them, their way of life, all over Vietnam. 
and the the U.S. government refused to pay any reparations. Um, they said that you know the U.S. was just as damaged as Vietnam was. Well, Vietnam lost three million people, huge tracts of agricultural land, and anyway, there's obviously no comparison. But um, the the U.S. Uh, I, as far as I know has has never. Um, made any attempt to pay any kind of uh, recompense to Vietnam or any other part of Indochina for the damage done. Oh, and one other thing that I, I feel like I should mention before I close this out, um, because I just can't talk that much longer, but the uh, the U.S., uh, <laughs> actually, Nixon specifically, <clears throat> lied to not only the, um, the American people, but the... Uh, the U S Congress about the bombing campaign that was going on in, um, Laos and Cambodia. Um, and the, the media went along with it at, at first. Um, eventually it became a, a thing, um, that was reported, but it was kept, uh, it was kept covered up, um, for quite a while. And then when Nixon was impeached, of course, they impeached him for uh, breaking into the um, the Democrat, um, whatever it was, the headquarters or what have you, Watergate. Um, but they left out that initially he was going to be impeached for his illegal bombing of Cambodia without congressional consent. Um, but they ended up leaving that out, that he wasn't even impeached for his war crimes. Um, and this is a common theme of the podcast that the war crimes are ignored, but the um, any crimes against the U.S. government um, are unforgiven. And uh, so he was impeached for um, essentially petty theft, but not for um, killing tens of thousands of innocent civilians in a country at, with which we weren't at war. Um, because Sihanouk said, who was the, the leader of Cambodia, um, said that... Uh, he had some disagreements with the people on the other side of the border, but it wasn't his business. And, um, and of course he didn't really control the borderlands and in, in the jungles of Indochina. So the, uh, um, Vietnamese were crossing the borders into, um, Cambodia as kind of a safe haven. Of course they could always cross the border into North Vietnam as a safe haven. And the truth is that almost all of the, the territory around them in South Vietnam would have really been a safe haven um, because the majority of the people that we were there to protect didn't want us there. And so, uh, there, that's a, that's a brief history of the Vietnam War, I suppose. Um, and the, uh, the lies and, uh, conceits of both the U.S. government and the American media, uh, which is supposed to be there to expose what the government's doing in our name, um, but what they mostly do is that they, uh, they provide stenography for government sources and they tell you what, you, what the government wants you to, to believe, to know, and, um, uh, and not much else. Thankfully that's changing a little bit because the internet has revolutionized media, obviously that I have the ability to talk to however many people listen to this podcast um, and there's so many others that are doing the same thing. It's a whole lot harder to limit the amount of information or the, the type of information that goes out to the people now. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. But it obviously, it still hadn't been stopped. They're still working very hard to keep dissenting voices off of the airwaves in one way or another. And, um, and we, we've got we to gotta stand against that. So I suppose that's it. And um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there because I don't want to talk anymore. <clears throat> you can probably hear it in my voice. But um, the, the reason that I wanted to bring this up now is that I think that if you think about it, um, you'll see a lot of parallels with what well, you'll see a lot of parallels with what was going on during the terror wars. Uh, and I think you'll see uh, parallels with what's with things that are going on today as well. Um, this is, uh, you know, 
there's the line by, um, well, it's attributed to uh, Mark Twain, but it doesn't seem to have originated actually with Mark Twain as a lot of things that are attributed to Mark Twain were, weren't. Anyway, he's credited with a lot of uh, witty sayings that he doesn't, it doesn't seem like he actually said. Um, but the, it seems to um, come, I think, from a, uh, like a psychology pamphlet, essay, something by something Reich um, in the 70s, the, the actual thought. But the, the way it's quoted from, supposedly from Mark Twain is, is just generally better, is that um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Uh, I did come across an old one from like the 19th century that says uh, um, history doesn't repeat itself, but historians repeat each other <laughs> or something like that. I got a kick out of that one. Uh, but, you know, hopefully we'll push against the um, the mainstream narrative on a lot of these things. I mean, that's certainly what we try to do with this podcast. I mean, it, we're not trying to be contrary just to be contrary. Um, and the, the information that we report here I'm confident and to the best of my ability. Um, and we'll continue to do so. And we'll have another podcast out to you later in the week. In the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, and or Podbean. Uh, like and share. Tell your friends. Um, leave reviews, comments. You can always email me at michael at thelibertymike.com. And uh, we'll be back later. Um, with my co-host when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Ciao.